Hello and welcome to episode 61 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the casual spike focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies in Modern and Pioneer. My name is Davislav here in Chicago. And with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the sun crowned Shane Beeps. Praise the sun, David. It's Davis Love. Now I've we're brothers. <laughs> Who's we? Me and me and uh, Stanislav Sivka are brothers. Mm, mm. Mm. Hello, good to see you. I'm brothers with a with a birthday boy. It's the birthday boy this week. Yes, Dan. Also with us from Chicago, it's the birthday boy, Stanislav. What's up? Stan, are you like you are you thirty yet? I turned 31 on Wednesday, so by the time our listeners hear this, I will be 31. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to reveal too much like OPSEC on you, but I hope it's okay to say happy birthday on the show. I'll allow it. I didn't know until 10 minutes ago, so <laughs> it's a good reminder. I kind of missed your birthday, so I guess I deserve it. I kept it secret this time. 41 yeah. is a lot less interesting than 40, that's for sure. How does it make you feel that we're 10 years apart? Uh, it... It pains me to my core every day when I talk to you about things and you go, you don't know about this. And then I talk to you about things and, and I, and you, I go, you don't know about Johnny mnemonic. And you're like, what's Johnny mnemonic. Yeah. Stan's like, I heard of that once. I, I saw Johnny mnemonic. I was alive when that movie came out. Sure. You were like six. Yeah. Yeah. It was big in the, in the Stanislav household. You don't know about Zendaya. Zendaya. <laughs> On this week's episode. We're going to break down the results from the Nerd Rage Gaming Modern and Pioneer Trials that took place in Indianapolis this weekend, better known as the Energy Series. Then we're going to take a look at the latest iteration of a classic creature combo deck. We're doing a patented deck dive on Heliod, Druid, Coco, Spike Feeder, Oat stuff. Oops, all combos. Green and white cards that I would never play. And finally, we wind down with a discussion on magic online etiquettes with an eye towards one specific issue. I'm sure you can't figure out what issue it's going to be after we all played this deck on magic online. <laughs> but first, some housekeeping. This week, we're excited to welcome the newest patron to the Dive Down Nation. Shout out to Alex L. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you in the Dive Down Nation. Alex, this is me thanking you personally. I'm going to look forward to chatting with you. I'm going to be looking for you in the Slack. Come and find me. Yeah, thanks to people like Alex and all the citizens of the Dive Down Nation, uh, members of our Patreon. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash the dive down. You can see all the cool swag we have to offer you. We have what? We have stickers, pins, cards, tokens, signed cards. Uh, we're slowly inching towards our stretch goal of uh, sleeves and deck boxes might just be deck boxes in the near future. Every day, Dave suggests we start printing hats every day. You know, guys, I just think the price is right and the people are going to love them. Who doesn't want a hat with Stan's face on it? <laughs> it's his birthday. Smiling. Stanislav tweet us at the dive down. If you want a hat with Stan's face on it or tweet at medium gallery to just tell him directly you want a hat with his face on it. He doesn't even have to do it as a dive down thing. Maybe it's just his own thing. Yeah, be, be prepared for us. We're going to reconfigure the Patreon probably in the next coming weeks. We're going to look at some of the, the tiers we have, the offerings we have, make some things more affordable, uh, kind of eliminate some things. It's, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be some new benefits, some stuff that you want to see. Yeah, we're really looking at the things that have worked since we started the Patreon and the things that really haven't turned out as we had expected. And we want to make sure that the Patreon tiers really give back to our listeners and our supporters in just the most fun and generous way possible. Yeah, we're also brought to you by Mana Traders. You can use code the dive down, all one word, for 15% off your first three months of renting Magic Online cards. They also said on Twitter today, I was having a conversation with them and somebody else, and they said that uh, they're going to bring back card rental, paper card rental, in the next few weeks. So that's been something that I think uh, has been part of their offerings, but it kind of fell by the wayside, but they're bringing it back. So that'll be rad too. So you don't have to seek out all those cards every time you're going to a tournament. You can just rent them from Mana traders yeah we're looking at you scg grinders constantly tweeting for cards ahead of your 
tournaments. Don't put those people on blast. We don't know what it's like to have that life. To just be, wake up every week and wonder where your Aether Gusts are. I, I don't know. <laughs> I need 12 spike feeders. I mean, when you're... When you live in Massachusetts and you're in Roanoke for two weeks straight and you realize you left your, your Aether Gust next to your nightstand, it's a tough <laughs> life. Also, today, Mana Traders announced that they have a brand new logo. So they're looking pretty tight these days. If you were worried about them before, about their uh, legitimacy as a business from the way they used to look, they're looking pretty tight. You should g- give them another shot. It's manatraders.com, code the dive down. Please check them out. We love the service. And now we're going to move over to Stanislav at the news desk to take us through the energy series Pioneer and Modern from last weekend. So if you're from outside the Midwest and you've never heard of NRG, it stands for something. And that is Nerd Rage Gaming. And it is actually a game store in the suburbs just north of Chicago. You can buy cards online from them. But they're also a tournament organizer. And over the last couple of years, they've been gradually increasing their footprint across the Midwest, organizing comp REL events that they call trials throughout Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Indiana, maybe even Missouri, though I'm not positive about that. It's a great series that that has been really expanding in influence. They have great coverage as well if you have off weeks where you know there's not as much gp coverage it used to be and maybe you're not interested in whatever scg is doing this week keep an eye out for energy on uh, on twitch yeah and their events span across constructed formats and draw the attention of a lot of talented and well-known players from this region sam black has been at nrg events ali warfield wyatt darby is often in the commentating booth Dylan Hand will sometimes play in these events. And likewise, our Slack channel's resident judge, Jack, the judge, was working this event and, and works with NRG a lot. Jack is our favorite judge. Sorry, judges, but he's ours. And this last weekend, they had back-to-back trial events for both Modern and Pioneer in Indianapolis. And they've already posted a bunch of the deck lists in addition to the deck distributions from both events. So we're going to try to cover both of those events, and let's start by looking at the Pioneer Trial, beginning with the overall meta share. So the Pioneer Trial had 156 total players, and this is a one-day event. So there's a Swiss tournament and then a cut to top eight. And the decks that had more than 5% representation are as follows. 15% of the field was on Demir Inverter. About 13% was on Lotus Breach. 10% 10% was Delirium, typically Sultai Delirium. About 10% was on Spirits, which are usually Bant Spirits. We saw 8% of various Mono Red variants, a little under 8% of Mono Black, a little under 8% of Blue White Control, and then there's a smattering of other archetypes, including uh, various green ramp strategies, Is It in Soul, Mono Right variants, onward and one lonely is it phoenix on our list here hey buddy i feel you so just looking at this overall breakdown uh a little over 10 different deck types feels kind of like a standard metagame to me in what i would consider a generally diverse standard format you think that's pretty fair uh i actually think it's more i mean i i think this is more diverse than standard tends to be standard tends to be about five decks i feel like five or six not that i'm an expert i haven't really played standard in i don't know five years but um that that's kind of i think what most people expect this is i think for an eternal format around 10 is reasonable yeah and and even the top deck is still only about 15 percent of the meta i mean i don't know if i love that takes dan it's like 15 percent of the room is a, is a single deck and then 13 percent of the room right behind it is like the, another sort of combo deck so we have the top two combo-ish decks in pioneer are over a quarter of the field yeah i mean i do think that's a little bit of, cons- of a concern and the the other thing to note is that if we had a bunch of tournaments in a row with one deck at 15 percent and 13 uh, and another deck at 13 percent and modern that would be kind of like alarm bell territory, I think, generally, right? Like we start to get worried when things get to be between 15 and 20% consistently. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that 
this probably can't keep up. I think that it's likely that these decks are potentially underplayed right now with compared to their their win percentage. So I think that if it's the kind of thing where it's like if you're not playing Inverter or Lotus Breach, you probably just really like other decks or think that they might have game against both or think that you can build your deck in a way that they have game against both of these top decks. But I think between Inverter, Breach, and Delirium, we're looking at probably what are considered the most powerful decks in the format. I don't think you can leave Spirits out of that right now. Yeah, I think I think Spirits is almost like the, the powerful deck that has game against those because it can be disruptive. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a number of events now thinking about the, the players tour from last week and the last couple of Grand Prix where Spirits is generally in that top tier with these other three decks. And so I think that we are looking at a tier one meta and maybe it's it's maybe those are the top two tiers really where it's kind of like inverter and lotus breach are tier one and then delirium and spirits are tier two and then the mono red mono black and blue white control decks that we've all gotten used to from earlier are the third tier and it you know it all depends on how you like to slice your onion but um, yeah i think this is a really interesting cross section like if you had asked me what i would expect to be at like a local like kind of grindery tournament, it would almost be this exact selection, which I find surprising. Like there's nothing that was really like a curveball for me here. And likewise, the, the soul Phoenix deck that we know of finished top 16, Uh, even a stop clock. You know, I love that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pick it up anytime soon again, but I do, I do love that Phoenix shows up occasionally. Yeah. It's like a cuckoo clock. A cuckoo clock. I have not seen the deck list. I'm going to take a quick look at it. That was it. Run anything spicy like Ox of Agonis or anything like that? No, it just... and it it doesn't have thing in the ice either. It's the young pyromancer version. Pyromancer one. Yeah, that's good. Still powerful. Yeah. So we also know the top sixteen from the event, and let's run through that. In first place, Cody Murray with Demir Inverter. Pretty stock list. Deck's good. Why fix something that isn't broken or is broken in all the right ways? <laughs> so I, I have one little thing to say about these inverter decks that are starting to concern me a little bit. And just as far as talking about like the health of the meta, here here's the canary in the coal mine, mine for me. One main deck mystical dispute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is worrisome to me that we're kind of feeling like it's enough value to run a main deck color hose card. I mean, mystical dispute, one of my favorite cards in the last year, but that's a little concerning. Yeah. It's kind of like when is it Phoenix was all over the place in modern and people started running main deck surgical extraction. Yeah. Reminiscent, right? It's like, yeah, you kind of have to run this former sideboard card in your main deck just because your odds of being paired up against this format menace are so elevated. I mean, at least Mystical Dispute always has some play. It's like a really bad mana leak. I feel like it has as much play as main deck surgical does, to be honest. Sure. But anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on each one of these decks, but that is something that I've noticed happening recently that's been slightly worrying. In second place was Dylan Husing with Mono Red Aggro, a pretty low to the ground aggro version with Zergo Bell Striker, as well as two Anex Hearted in the Forge main. Yeah, this is a cool build. Um, it's got a couple Ember Cleaves, only 23 lands. Its top end is only three Torbran for the four drop slot. And I think this is how you want to be building your red decks right now. You you want to shave your four casting cost spells. You want more one and two casting cost spells. You got the couple of Rimrock Knights in there for like your pump slot and creature. The Annex is a really cool uh, three drop, I think, as well, because it has some sort of residual value. And also it can be really strong if you just you know, have a big board full of red creatures. So I think by and large, this is kind of a good direction for red decks to take. I think really it's kind of shave your top end down to three Torbran, season to taste, get them dead. Yeah. I mean, Annex coming into Pioneer, I don't think it's too much of a surprise given how much success it's having in standard recently. Mm-hmm. I think two Ember Cleave is really smart, actually. I ran one in Phoenix and I think I would have rather have had one fewer like four drop spell and had another Ember Cleave just for the speed because you just have to be faster and Ember Cleave allows you to do that. But what is this in third, fourth place? 
<laughs> what? Third or fourth place. Boros, Boros feather. feather. I'm I'm thrilled. I, I didn't realize this until just now. Hey, man. I saw a few feather decks at the top tables. Did you really? I mean, just a few. I mean, it wasn't like storm. It wasn't storming over the everybody, but it was doing something. I mean, I, I do still love this deck. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, the energy series from what I've seen so far, you know, I played in one of the trials. I did really badly in it a couple of months ago, but, um, Hey man, we all did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and I were playing the same deck. I don't know if that was got too much publicity on the podcast, but the, uh, you know, the, it does have a little bit of that local meta vibe where, where you get the rogue decks that appear sometimes. And so, I'll be curious to see. This is a little bit of incentive for me to suit Feather back up. There's not anything too weird about this particular build, I will say. One thing that's interesting is that it's running a one of Ryle, which is kind of like a fun cantrip that you can use sometimes. It does also feel like if you're someone who's been into Feather in the past, um, it is running... Every deck I've seen lately is running for a four of GERD for battle, which is a card that I was kind of not into at first, but maybe is just really, really powerful because... Um, it does give you two heroic triggers, and so that's pretty nice. Yeah, the other third slash fourth place deck was Jacob Dyer on Simic Ramp. Yeah, cool looking build. I think it's interesting that there's so much variety in these Simic Ramp decks. There's not a lot of consistency. There's a lot of small differences between them. I don't think anyone really knows the best way to build them at the moment. I think they're much less popular than some of the other powerful strategies in Pioneer. But I think that if you like this kind of strategy, it's totally worth testing out and sleeping up yeah and it looks like the fifth through eighth spots were split so in no particular order we've got kyle gunn with bant spirits joshua satterfield with demir inverter and alex williams as well as bill caminos with sultai delirium moving on to nine through 16th likewise there appears to have been a split here so, in no particular order, we had Is It in Soul? Single copy of Is It in Soul in the top 16 with one Shadow Spear main deck, as well as one in the sideboard, and my friends, a main deck copy of Dive Down. What? Yes. I've seen I've seen a few dive downs in uh it was what RPT Nagoya, I think, had a lot of uh Is It in Soul in their top eight, and there were some dive downs there. I think the Shadow Spear makes a lot of sense in the Insole deck specifically because it's one, it's an artifact you can insole if you need a target, but two, Trample and Lifelink are valuable things for your five fives or better to have when there's like O3 blockers out there or Seder Wayfinders out there trying to buy time. And you're like, well, by this time, as I steamroll over you for four points of damage. I love Shane's new catchphrase. By this time. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Pinworthy. So do you think then that the activated ability of removing uh, indestructible or hexproof is almost flavor text currently? I think in that deck, yes. I mean, like potentially what you could like target a Heliod with it and what uh, uh, roast them or something. <laughs> Heliod's never a creature. Let's be real. No. Not frequently. In mono white. In the mono white. Oh, in mono white. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about modern here, but we also saw in the top sixteen an is it Phoenix deck, which we mentioned was running for main deck Pyromancer instead of Thing in the Ice. Uh, Singleton Bant Spirits, Sultai Delirium, mono white aggro, another Demir Inverter, actually two more Demir Inverter, and another Bant Spirits. Yeah. Looks like looks like Pioneer. So no breach in the top 16. Do you think that this deck may be easier to hate on than Inverter is? I think so, personally. Because it's easy just to like throw a couple damping spheres in your sideboard and cross your fingers. And I think that Demir Inverter requires more narrow answers, like maybe like Essence Scatter. Like you're seriously going to run an Essence Scatter in your sideboard. Or... You have to be running blue for that if you're running blue for Mystical Dispute. So it's like a narrow, it's not an artifact based answer. Hmm. I mean, it's interesting because it had such great performance at the Players Tour 
in Phoenix and all of Channel Fireball was on it and all that kind of stuff. It's it's interesting that maybe they just timed the meta right where people weren't thinking about that deck anymore and then it just kind of happened. But yeah, it's like when Dredge is like, oh hey, I'm gonna arrive and most people have like one copy of a graveyard hate card and then it Dredge does really well and now they have three. Yeah. Yeah, everybody got rest in peace this week. So also the top 16 had three copies of Band Spirits and three copies of Soul Tide Delirium, both about 10% of the overall tournament meta. And it looks to me like people recognize that these were really strong choices going into the weekend, though perhaps weren't getting as much publicity as the top two combo decks. Yeah, I mean, I think Soul Tide Delirium is a great deck. I would definitely be happy to play it at the, like, the next time I go to the LGS. It's just a matter of going to the LGS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the one thing that's really interesting about this is that these are the decks that have the broken cards that don't have homes in other places, right? Like Band Spirits has Collected Company, Soul Tide Delirium has Uro, which, you know, ostensibly has a home in Cynic Ramp, but that's not as popular of a deck. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think of the fact that half of the top 16 are aggro decks? You know, with the exception of Demir Inverter these delirium strategies and these ramp strategies, like everything else from mono white to Phoenix to mono red, even Boros feather. Like these are all very aggressive strategies. I like it. It makes me feel like I have a chance to compete against inverter and, um, and breach with this, but um, we'll see how it, how it continues to roll out. What do you think, Shane? I mean, you were playing a moderately aggro deck last week yeah i mean i think the interest here is how aggro do you have to be to beat the combo decks right or can you play an aggressive deck that also has a certain kind of disruption to beat inverter and to beat the uh, underworld breach deck right and so the concern here is will there be like a single mid-range deck in sultai delirium will there be two combo decks in inverter and Lotus Breach, and then there'll be basically a pile of very aggressive decks. And then like Bant Spirits is your disruptive and also extremely aggressive deck. It can it can really get power onto the board very quickly, Bant Spirits does. So yeah, I mean I think it will remains to be seen how powerful Watsy knows the the win percentages of like the Demir Inverter and the Lotus Breach decks online. So I'm sure they're paying attention. But I'm happy with it. I'm, I think this is a perfectly good outcome of the tournament. I think the top eight, top 16 looks pretty cool. Yeah, my last call out about this top 16, no control at all. And as a somewhat passive observer of Pioneer, I think it's really interesting to see this ebb and flow over the last few months, including the rise and fall of blue-white control specifically. Yeah, I mean, plenty of people did do well with blue-white control at, at Phoenix. So I think it's you know, maybe the players here were like, I want my control control and win the long game deck to be Salt Eye Delirium instead of Blue White Control this weekend. Yeah, I mean it's probably variants in the same way that Breach not making it is just variants, right? Like those are those are decks that have reasonable win win rates, and we saw that from the meta from the uh, meta analysis from Phoenix. So I, I wouldn't take that as an indication of anything about Blue White in Pioneer right now. So real quick, because we're about to stop talking about Pioneer for the rest of the episode here. Mm -hmm. How do, I mean, the band kind of talk is continuing here. Are we, what do you guys think about the meta here? And I guess I'm really talking to Shane because Stan's a little less exposed to Pioneer right now. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, basically the same take as I did last week because I've been playing modern this past week. And I think it's just kind of wait and see. I think it's, we, it's interesting that, you know, the Underworld Breach deck did get hit out of the top 16 so easily. So is it a matter of people finding the answers to Demir Inverter next? And do those exist? So we'll have to see. Well, I mean, I thought it was super interesting. Just as a Twitter update, I'm sure most engaged Magic players saw this, but someone uh, tweeted at Aaron Forsyth about bands, and he basically responded that he keeps seeing people ask about pioneer bands and a reminder that pioneer is not on the weekly band schedule anymore and that bands will be announced with one week of notice, meaning they'll say a week before 
they're going to have a banned and restricted announcement that they're going to have a banned and restricted announcement. So imagine, imagine it this way. A tweet will go out that says there will be a banned and restricted announcement on Monday, blah, 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 blah date. And then they're not going to say what it is. They're not going to say what's going in it, but they're just saying we're about to make a change in a format seven days from now. He said at the end of this thought, reminder, helpful reminder to everybody that there are no bands, no banned and restricted announcements on the calendar right now. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Very complicated, but but an interesting interesting reminder from the top, basically. I mean, there's no universe where people wouldn't ask for a ban for something or other. I mean, I think this is a good reminder, Stan, that things have gotten very ban heavy in the last couple of year or last year. They've gotten much worse. There's been a lot more in the last 12 months across all formats. And so people are people talk about it anyway. And now they're talking about it a lot more. And I think it's just a good reminder that Aaron and the people at Wizards are watching what's going on and actively said that there is nothing that they're planning on doing right now. Mm-hmm. But Stan, we also had uh, some modern stuff, right? That we can we can get through? Yeah, we have a little less data, so this will go by a bit faster. And I actually want to send a very special thanks to the NRG series coordinator, Max Kahn. Uh, you may have seen him yourself in Comp Ariel events that you've been to because Max is a fixture of competitive magic, a level two judge that travels the country and works at a lot of high level events. And he also put together the post tournament deck data um, for NRG trial weekend in Indianapolis. So, although the top 16 for this event for the modern portion wasn't ready when we started recording on Monday, Max was very generous and shared the top eight deck lists with us to talk about on this podcast. So thanks again, Max. You're a real one. And of course, thank you to Jack the Judge for hooking us up with, for vouching for us with Max. Yeah, Jack was feeding me like anecdotal data and various stories and narratives from the weekend. So thank you to Jack. So the modern event had 126 total players. And likewise, the decks that had about 5% or more of the meta share were Amulet Titan with about 13% of the meta, Heliod Combo with about 5%, Dun Dun Dun, Bant Snowblade also with about 5%. Uh, and then Burn, as well as Mono Red Prowess, had just under 5%. But I'll round them up. <laughs> and then the rest of the field was a lot of familiar faces, ranging from Etron to Dredge, even Green Tron, some other Green Titan decks, Wurza, Blue White Control, Shadows. Wow. So, initial reactions. Amulet, as the most popular deck, I think is probably no surprise to us on this podcast, especially considering the conversation we had last week. Yeah, I mean, it's by a long shot here, though. Like, you don't typically... I don't feel like you typically see a meta in Modern where one deck is two and a half times more percentage than the next deck behind it. Especially in, like, a paper tournament, you know? That's pretty surprising to me. And this is just... A reminder, this is just straight-up deck submissions. So this is all the decks that were registered for this particular event. Right, and this is just Amulet Titan... It does not include other Titan field strategies, for instance. The real crazy thing here to me is 47 other. And that means that, that two or fewer of the same deck are registered, you know, that many times. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I think you're looking for 23 times would be the, the, the number. <laughs> At least 23 times, maybe more. <laughs> 23 to 47 times. Yes. Here's a bit of a curveball for me. Heliod combo? As number two kind of came out of left field. Yeah. And I wonder if people are beginning to identify as this might be a deck that kind of skirts the expected meta and can catch people off guard. Yeah, we'll definitely have one or two things to say about this deck this episode. Yeah, so the top eight for the modern trial goes as follows. Will Kruger won the event with Green White Titan. Will's actually a pretty noteworthy player. Uh, For those who don't know him, he is X-Whale on Magic Online, currently number four on the Modern League leaderboard. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he was essentially playing a Titan field deck, 
that had Valakit and no mountains, thanks to four main deck copies of Dryad of the Elysian Grove. Yeah, this deck is interesting. I played against it a couple of times online, and it's more just that I, you know, there's no amulet. It's kind of feels a little bit like playing against Titan Shift, but they don't ever shift you. <laughs> they got other stuff going on. And um, boy, it really is just all about the Dryad, like mm-hmm. like Stan said. And I also was definitely, the first couple of times I played against this deck, I was definitely expecting to get like spell pierced occasionally or packed and negationed, and they do not run those cards. Mm-hmm. So one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, there's a there's a Titan deck out there that's really not running with any kind of protection. It's running more with like Path to Exile and Rest in Peace and stuff like that coming out of the board with a lot of green cards main. Yeah, in second place we had Adam Reishig with Heliod Company. So this is the Anafenza uh Kin Tree Spirit version. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact name of that version of Anafenza, but this one doesn't have the infinite mana combo. Uh, we'll go more into the specific nuances of this deck later. But in third and fourth place, we had Ivan Espinoza on blue-white control. So not Stoneblade. The only seven creatures in the 75 were three main deck Snapcaster and one Vendillion Click that I personally believe should have been a Brazen Borrower. <laughs> also... One circle of protection red in the sideboard. I mean, you know what? Prowess cannot do anything about that card. And so I guess you, uh, you know, you keep that up. If you got enough mana, if you get ahead on lands, it seems like a pretty effective tool. Well, you have to pay to get the life. So why not just run Dragon's Claw? Uh, Circle of protection red, it doesn't get, I mean, it doesn't get you life. It it prevents the damage from happening. Mm, Good call. So, so it prevents you from like getting hit by creatures even. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever source you want. And it's, it's there forever. I always forget that circle of protections are legal in modern. Isn't that crazy? Not that there's any reason to play them, but I mean, I guess, I guess I haven't found a reason to play them, but I think they were printed in ninth edition. Oh, okay. Uh, and the other quarter finalist was Bill Caminos, who also played in the pioneer trial. Uh, and in the modern tournament, they were on four color Wurza with three Blood Moon in the side. Love to see it. Wow, Bill with the double top eight. Oh my. Hey, Bill, I know you're probably not out there listening, but good for you. Bill, if you are listening, put a copy of Dive Down in a 75 that gets published and we'll know. And make sure we know that you're safe. Or just tweet us. <laughs> and then the split for fifth through eighth included Peter Oaks on Amulet Titan. Chris Iali on Green White Druid. So not a Heliod version. This is just kind of like the classic Druid deck. Jack Cummins on Blue Black Wurza. And a friend of mine, Phil Silberman on Sultai Snow. Running the only Uro deck in the top eight. Had three main deck Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath in there. Likewise, uh, Jack the Judge, who we mentioned previously told me that the blue-white control player and the Abzan combo player, so that's Ivan and Adam, they came to the event together, and I guess they told some people that one of them had to make semifinals to make their trip worth it. And then they actually got paired against each other in the quarterfinals due to just the seeding structure of the top eight. Oh, man. Well, one of them made it then. Yeah. Some quick takeaways from this tournament. I mean, don't leave home without a plan against Amulet Titan. I I feel like at this point, Titan is just doing the most broken thing that's possible in modern right now. It's very good. It's very, very good. Yeah, it's yeah, extremely consistent, extremely good. Also, I don't play Urza, but pleased to see that Urza, still a decent card and has a home. Now you're pleased by that? Sure, why not? Disdainful stroke. Problem solved. Heliad combo getting more popular. So nice timing on today's deck dive, guys. You know what? We've been planned weeks in advance, and so we're just here to help. <laughs> and this last one, is, this is a dagger for me to, to say out loud, but not one lightning bolt in the entire top eight. I'm going to have to get my tattoo changed. <laughs> Man, not one lightning bolt. Remember when that was the most popular card in modern? I mean, kind of. It was a simpler time then. Here is one thing that I will just say, and we can think about it or 
keep in mind the uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of once upon a time floating around here at the top of the metagame right now i mean amulet and heliod both have it and so uh yeah it's a pretty good card probably my favorite card in the last uh last six months and it, i'm definitely not going to get to play it forever so enjoy it i don't know i think it's at the modern power level mm, it's free so i mean it's really nice on turn one or you know sometimes even turn two if all you have is like a turn one land and like you top deck it yeah um but when you draw multiples it's like super fair yeah yeah but modern modern also lasts like six turns so Exactly. That's why I think that first one being free and only the first one being free is actually kind of appropriate for the power level of the format. No, it's not. Let's see. I, I agree. To, I will agree to disagree with you. I'll agree with myself. I disagree with you, Stan. You know what? It's just sweet to play with, though, at any rate. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> handshake, Shane. Handshake emoji. Where's the handshake? Where's the handshake emoji with three hands? Because I <laughs> would like to get in that handshake, too. I feel left out. And that's it for this week's breakdown. We're going to take a quick break and we return. It's going to be all about that sweet, sweet sun crowned spike feeding devoted druid in combo. Stay with us. And we're back. This week, we're headed back to modern. Again, like last week, we talked about modern. This week, we're going to talk about modern, but we're doing our first modern deck dive in a few months with the evolution of the green-white druid slash heliod slash other stuff combo decks. The printing of Heliod, Sun, Crown, and Theros Beyond Death made people really, really just freak out. Do you remember when that card got spoiled on Twitter? Mm Mm-hmm. How quickly after it got spoiled did people say it was going to lead to a banning? 30 seconds. It was it was seconds that people were like, get rid of Walking Ballista now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I already hate this card. Get it out of here. It's going to ruin Pioneer. And it seems like a really easy combo with Walking Ballista. And to be clear, I mean, I even really thought that this combo was going to be a much bigger player in Pioneer, but it seems like it's really made more of a home in uh in modern than anywhere else because of a whole bunch of the enablers and other kind of broken e combo cards that exist sure so interestingly heliod combos with a few more things in our favorite format modern and was quickly identified as a new option for the classic creature combo toolbox strategies so this week we're going to take a look at heliod company and that's collected company for you for you new magic players we're going to cover the overall strategy of the deck or decks because there's multiple different iterations of Heliod's kind of uh, strategies, how the cards are going to attempt to execute that strategy, why you might want to play the deck and why you might not want to play it, the strategies for playing with and against it, and our general thoughts and feelings about Heliod itself as the centerpiece of a new branch of creature combo decks. So let's start at the beginning. Shane, can you take us through what the deck's trying to do? So I think fundamentally you can look at these like Heliod company combo decks as a creature combo deck that's using various two or three card combos to do things like generate an arbitrarily large amount of life, which a lot of decks just can't win against. You can generate infinite damage. You can generate arbitrarily large amount of mana, which you can then use to cast or tutor up and then cast like a giant walking ballista for lethal amounts of damage. There's some other like corner case game plans, like generating a ton of counters to put on your creatures and then sort of just get a really big battlefield and swing in for lethal damage. What's interesting about the deck, though, is like most good combo decks in modern, the deck doesn't just have to rely on getting exactly two cards. There's a lot of redundancy built into the deck that allows you to reliably get the pieces that you want and generate board states that allow you to do interesting or annoying things for your opponent. So, so just to be clear, it's a deck full of many, many different combos, 
right? And different cards synergize with each other in different ways. But realistically, there's three strategies, right? Yeah. And we're going to kind of help. You're going to take everybody through understanding how these those three main strategies work. And those are infinite life, infinite damage, yeah. infinite mana. Yeah. And infinite mana and infinite damage are really intertwined, but there's a couple different ways you can generate the infinite damage using that. So I'll start with the infinite life and then you all can talk about the other ways. Cause I think the infinite life is kind of one of the coolest things you can do with this deck. So there's a couple of ways the deck has to generate infinite life, which is one of your primary win cons against a lot of the modern field. So it's actually really Slightly important, perhaps not really important for us to mention that you can't really have an infinite amount of life in magic. You can't have an infinite amount of creatures, mana, whatever. You can say something like 800 billion if you want. So when you hear us say infinite, you can just hear us saying a number is so big that it doesn't matter anymore. So generating infinite life is typically enough for most decks to scoop to you, as I mentioned, because even if they might have more cards left in their deck than you, and they would win by you decking eventually, you usually have so much time to build some kind of infinite damage combo or like a really large board of creatures that can eventually attack through your opponent's defenses that it doesn't matter anyway, uh, even if they're ahead on their deck. Yeah, and that's the key thing, I think, is that people expect infinite life to just be kind of game over because you have infinite life and that's not why, right? It's because it either buys you time to kill your opponent or it buys you time to kill your opponent in a much more boring way. Yeah. And of course, if the opponent has like an alt win con, like say that Karn liberated, they're playing in fact, they have a Thassa's Oracle or a laboratory maniac. Infinite life is also not going to be good enough there. But let's look at the the key piece to this infinite life combo, and it's Heliod Sun Crowned. So this is our new centerpiece. It's two and a white for a 5-5 five, five legendary enchantment creature god with indestructible. And so if you have less devotion to white than five, Heliod isn't a creature. It's just sitting there as an enchantment. And devotion, if you're in if you're new, really new, uh, that means you have fewer than five pips of white on permanence you control on the battlefield. One important rules text is that Heliod, though it does say it's not a creature without the adequate devotion, the card itself is still a creature card. So if you have like a counter spell that only targets creatures, you can use it to counter Heliod. And more importantly, you can play it off of Collected Company, but we'll get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, the important text on heliod though is whenever you gain life put a one one counter on target creature or enchantment you control uh you can also pay one in a white and give another target creature lifelink until end of turn now shane i'm a hardened magic player and i understand that life gain in magic especially modern isn't good (laughs) yes typically it's it's kind of incidental value but there's so many ways that this deck allows you to use life gain to generate some cool combos. So I think the primary and easiest one in this deck is spike feeder. So the gain life ability that's triggered from Heliod combos really nicely with spike feeder, which is a card originally printed in stronghold and then reprinted in time shifted. So thus it's modern legal. So basically it's, it's a one green green for a zero zero that comes onto the battlefield with uh, two plus one plus one counters on it, right? Um, and so you can remove a one one counter from Spike Feeder for free and gain two life. Then that triggers the Heliod's uh, triggered ability, says you can put a one one counter back onto something you control. You put one of those one one counters back onto Spike Feeder. If there's no disruption from your opponent, you can just do that over and over. You demonstrate a loop, you say, I've got 900 billion life. And we'll keep playing if you'd like. That's the easiest way to generate the infinite life. But there's a couple other ways. Yeah, I was just going to say, here's the thing about Spike Feeder real quick, though. Doesn't cost mana to activate its activated ability. Yes, important. The other thing is, do not take both counters off by accident on Magic Online. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, don't do that. Because we've all done, all three of us, I think, did that at different points in testing the last week. Just click wrong. We're going to talk about this a lot more, I suspect, later, but... You got to click right with this deck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Click right. You got to really pay attention to your triggers with this deck. Spike Feeder is the biggest example of misclicks possible, I think, in this deck. Yes, yeah, so you have to click correctly and often. <laughs> yes. Um, 
So other ways you could generate infinite life is let's say you have a Viserys here or a Carrion Feeder in your deck. It's a single black mana creature, gives you a free sack outlet. So both of those give you some incidental value for the sack. Um, Viserys here gets you a scry. Uh, Carrion Feeder gets you a plus one, plus one counter. But what card am I sacrificing to those? Ah, the important thing you're sacrificing is a Kitchen Finks. So Kitchen Finks has persist. So when it comes into the battlefield, gains two life. When it dies, it persists. It comes back out of the graveyard, gains you two more life, but has a negative one, negative one counter on it. However, imagine, just imagine you had a card or cards that put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature when you gained life, like Heliod, or didn't allow negative one, negative one counters to be placed on your creatures at all like Vizier of Remedies. Or it put a plus one, plus one counter on the creature with the lowest toughness when a creature enters the battlefield, like Anathenza, Kintree Spirit. So then you would have a magical, normal, counterless, fresh as a daisy kitchen finks back on the battlefield, ready to be sacrificed again, scrying through your deck as you did it, gaining plus one, plus one counters as you did it. And so that's a way to generate infinite life as well. Yeah, these oafs are ready to get back up all in your kitchen again. So this now is a three-card combo, yes. right? Uh, unlike Spike Feeder and Heliod, which just work well in tandem together, now you need the free sack outlet, something like Kitchen Finks, and either Heliod or Anafenza to basically undo those negative one counters. Yeah, so it's a little bit less elegant, but we'll get into a card later that easily tutors up your sack outlet. Yeah, I mean, I think that the big thing about these cards is that they provide time, mm -hmm. right? Like Kitchen Finks is a card that has been used by a long time for a lot of different decks to, to buy time. So because it comes into play and you gain some life, then it dies and you gain some life. And so not everything is always about like comboing off with this deck. Sometimes the pieces are just good enough to be able to put them in play. Give yourself some time until you get to the combo that's going to actually win you this particular game. So I mentioned Vizier of Remedies. Um, she comes into play with her infinite mana combination later, but since she plays here, I'll just go over her card deck because it's so important. Um, one in a white for a 2-1 uh, human cleric. If one or more minus one, minus one counters be placed on a creature you control, that many minus one, minus one counters, minus one, are put on it instead. Effectively in this deck, it means your creatures don't get minus one, minus one counters. And so there's a lot of things that you're able to do with that. The The deck also typically seems to have either Anafenza Kintree Spirit supporting the Kitchen Finks combo and also potentially providing like a slightly faster walking ballista combo as well, which we'll also talk about later. Or it has Vizier of Remedies to allow for both the Finks combo and also generally supporting uh, the infinite mana combo, uh, which uh, I think Stan can get into right now. Yeah, so not every build of this deck has the opportunity to generate infinite mana, which has in fact been a cornerstone of these styles of decks since Vizier of Remedies was printed in Amonkhet. And people realized it neatly comboed with another cheap creature called Devoted Druid to generate endless green mana. So if you're not familiar with Devoted Druid, it is one in a green for an O2 elf druid that taps to add green, or you may put a negative one, negative one counter on Devoted Druid to untap it. So since negative one, negative one counters can't go on Druid when the Vizier is in play, thanks to Vizier's static ability, you just get to untap it for free and make a bunch of green mana, essentially as much as your heart desires. 900 billion even. Yeah. And with this mana, you can do a number of things. Ideally, you're casting a giant lethal walking ballista from your hand. But you can also tutor a spell. Uh, often you're using something like Finale of Devastation to get and make a giant walking ballista. Or pull any creature to make it very big. Uh, basically so big that nothing else can deal with it. Yeah, when you, you know, if you have a board of creatures, it gives all your creatures plus X, plus X. So that allows you just to attack for lethal sometimes off of that uh, finale of devastation. Yeah, it's also important to note that the Devoted Druid can just be used as a valuable ramp tool by itself. So if you untap with Druid, you can make two mana the next turn. And it's something to remember, even if you don't have a Vizier, it's still making mana for you to ramp into Heliod or to double spell. Likewise, there's the infinite damage 
combo, which is really important to pretty much any version of this deck. Um, and there are other ways to generate infinite damage beyond just Heliod and Walking Ballista. As we said before, the thing that got people worked up about Heliod was when it was spoiled that the interaction with Walking Ballista, um, an XX creature that comes into play with X counters on it, and you can remove a counter to deal one damage to any target. And if Walking Ballista has two counters on it, and you have Heliod out with one and a white mana available, you give Ballista lifelink, ping the opponent, trigger counter ability on Heliod, put a new counter on Ballista, and repeat until the opponent is dead. The issue with this is that it can be pretty slow to get the Ballista combo online because... So slow. Yeah, it's pretty mana intensive. But if you have an Fenza Kintry Spirit out and cast a Ballista for two, it will bolster it up to two counters, mm. which is pretty cool. A little bit of a speed boost there. You got to go fast, Shane. Got to go fast. Ultimately, winning through infinite damage is frequently how the deck finishes off the opponent after gaining infinite life through the potentially easier to execute life gain combos that are available in these decks. But there are some fun ways to generate really big creatures on board by setting up life gain, sacrifice loops that allow you to put counters on every creature on your board to turn something like your bird of paradise into a gigantic lethal flyer. Those are a little bit more convoluted to set up, but definitely still options if you need to get out of a sticky situation. So just to recap here, we have this kind of like mega archetype of decks, right? Yeah. Green white toolbox creatures the core of it is all around heliod now yeah now right it's all kind of shifted over and what we're looking at here is kind of like one build that is trying to maximize getting to a gigantic walking ballista as fast as possible in the the sort of like anafenza version right like it still has the spike feeder combo it still has the kitchen finks combo so it has some infinite life stuff but it doesn't have the infinite mana combo and then on the flip side we have these decks that are still kind of running the infinite mana combo with vizier of remedies and devoted druid Mm -hmm. to be able to kind of utilize tools like finale of devastation as another way to win as well do you think that's kind of like the main two versions of the deck that are floating around right now for sure. I think that the the Vizier Druid deck is trying to generate the infinite mana and it does worse against interaction. And I think that the Anafenza build is designed to say, hey, I don't need to put these these two slightly clumsy creatures into play to try to generate infinite mana. I have the ability to maybe get in there and combat a little bit more or eventually grind you out. There's typically some giver of runes in the Anafenza Kintry Spirit build to provide some creature protection. So it's kind of saying, like, I'll get there eventually, and I don't need to finale of devastation on turn three type thing. Mm-hmm. Does does one of these go off earlier than the other one? It can, yeah. Does the does the infinite mana one go off earlier just because you you do happen to to walk into those turn three combos quite quite a bit more frequently? That's the goal, I think, is like, hey, this creature is gonna not get pathed it's not going to get pushed or bolted it's going to stick on the board because amulet titan is not interacting with me um or maybe the, even like a, a wurza type deck isn't necessarily interacting with me and so i'm just going to get there definitely not game one yeah the way i sort of saw the difference between the two is that the anafenza version kind of gives you something more to do with your mana if you don't have access to the combo so you can just turn creature sideways and sometimes like even win that way whereas the devoted druid version is almost like an oops all combos deck where if you're not comboing off there isn't much you actually get to do to as a fail state yeah that that does kind of stink i will say now i kind of just uh skip ahead a little bit i think that the amount of time that Heliod sat on the battlefield as like an enchantment waiting to combo off with something else was kind of frustrating to me. And I think the double white pips of Anafenza is certainly an advantage there because you you stick that, maybe you have a kitchen finks on the board, your uh, Heliod comes alive, you you know, you have a ranger captain of Eos out, Heliod comes alive along with Anafenza. So I think it's a perfectly sensible two drop. Great. Okay. So I think that's a great recap of kind of like the, 
big version of these plans. But there is a part of this deck that is way, way more important. It's the deck that it's the part of the deck that really makes it possible mm-hmm. to play these cards, right? And that is the amazing suite of kind of green tutors that are floating around right now in modern. Yeah, they rule. Yeah, the Vizier Druid version really has a lot of redundancy and consistency thanks to the fact that there's these tutors available at various mana costs. The most important one that's consistent across both of the versions of the deck is Collected Company. It's essentially one of the namesake cards in these decks. So if you're not a green player, if you're Dave, Collected Company is three and a green for an instant. Look at the top six cards of your library. Put up to two creature cards with CMC three or less from among them onto the battlefield and put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So not only is this one of the best ways to actually generate card advantage, but you can occasionally sort of tutor up needed pieces for your combos. Not a true tutor, but it helps. Yeah, I think ostensibly... The goal of the card is to like get you that needed piece because you're digging six deep. You can even get both pieces of like various two card combos at the end of your opponent's turn. Untap and win. Uh, you know, you get that spike feeder heliod combo, you get that devoted druid and vizier remedies. Or if you're me, you get like a single noble hierarch and nothing else. And walking ballista, and you're like, thanks. I'm gonna put that walking ballista back in the deck. See you later, Ballista. If you ever see Walking Ballista off a of Coco, do not put it on the battlefield unless you have something on the battlefield that lets it come in as a creature that's bigger than zero zero. Or if you have Eternal Witness in your hand, I guess, and you really need it. Fair. That's that's the other thing that you can do too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's really interesting that you said this is the most important one of the tutors. I guess it is, because this was a deck before. Eldraine came out and before Theros came out and it still ran Coco in it. It just ran also quarter calling and finale of devastation and other, other kind of green tutor cards like that. But I mean, collected company is just like we were talking about in earlier in the breakdown. It is a broken esque card. It's a very, very powerful card. It cheats you a ton of mana and a ton of tempo. And so using it to enable a combo seems like a natural fit. Yeah. That's, I want to do a little, explanation of why this card is so good right and and the you might ask why is this not running uh ella damry's call right for a white and a green okay so that's two mana that's cheaper right two mana instant speed tutor okay so let's say end of your opponent's turn you cast ella damry's call and you want to go get a uh, a heliod so that that in itself is five mana of value, and you didn't even get it onto the battlefield. You would spend five mana to get a single Heliod onto the battlefield. Or you could cast Collected Company for four CMC. You could get a Heliod and a Spike Feeder. Mm-hmm. That's six mana worth of creatures onto the board instantly. So that's like just the, the example of like how much more power, while not tutoring exactly, like a Coco is versus something like Ella Damry's in, the, in a deck that relies on three drops especially. Yeah, and don't even talk to me about how good it is when you collect a company into a Ranger Captain of Eos to grab your walking ballista Mm -hmm. to then sacrifice your Ranger Captain so that you can cast your walking ballista with no interaction and kill them. Oh, yeah, super good. That's some good stuff. All right, other tutors. Uh, Once upon a time, we mentioned that earlier in the episode, great card to dig for needed mana or creatures early or late. It's banned in Pioneer for a reason. Does everyone know what this card does? I mean, I would hope so, but let's see what it's uh you can look at the top six cards of your library. Five. Five cards. Not like Coco. Five. Take take a land or creature from it and put it into your hand. But uh it can be cast for free if it's the first spell you cast in the game. Yes. So free is good. Let me tell you, every deck I've been playing in modern for the last two months has once upon a time in it. It's not always four. Sometimes it's only three. But uh, it is very good. Dave, how many of the decks that you've been playing over the last couple of months run Finale of Devastation? Just this one. All right, cool. So I will, I will remind you what Finale does, just in case you forgot. XGG for a sorcery. Search your library and or graveyard for a creature with CMC X or less and put it on the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. If X is 10 or more, creatures... You control, get plus X plus X, and gain haste until end of turn. 
So this seems to be run only in the Druid Vizier combo versions of the deck as it's a great payoff for infinite mana and your combo pieces are really cheap so that X doesn't have to be that large to get this card online. Yeah, one thing that's interesting and I'd be curious to see what, what Shane thinks about this because, you know, in the the version of the deck that we ran, which is the the um, a deck that Chris Castro Rapple from Grindcast posted and shared with everybody, I was really reluctant to use Finale of Devastation to just dig up a combo piece Mm -hmm. because it's at sorcery speed. And I was much more often trying to finagle other things so that I could get my infinite mana combo and then use this as my kill card, much in the same way you would use as walk. You would use walking ballista as a kill card or something like that. Do you, do you feel like you were being a little bit precious with these or were you just kind of going for it and being like, I'm going to tutor up Vizier of remedy and just be like happy with it. I think it really depends on the situation, which is kind of the lamest answer, right? But I think like I think you're probably right, Dave, where it's like if they don't have hand disruption, you're probably okay sandbagging it for your win con. Well, also, unlike Walking Ballista, you have multiple copies of Finale of Devastation. So if you've got two in your hand, I think it's okay to cast it for value just because you've got more to choose from later on. For sure. Keep it moving. Yeah. The other tutor we want to talk about is Ranger, Captain of Eos. One white, white for a 3-3 creature, human, soldier. When Ranger enters the battlefield, you may search a library for a creature with CMC 1 or less. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. It also has a line of text. Sacrifice Ranger, Captain of Eos. Your opponents cannot cast non-creature spells this turn. So this card does a lot for the deck. We've kind of danced around that already, but it's two devotion for Heliod. So could help get a 5-5 indestructible creature online. It also finds your one walking ballista so you can more consistently kill people. Generally, Ranger Captain is a four of in these decks. And and walking ballista is a one of. That's the the big point that Stan was just saying. Want to want to underline that you need to be careful with your walking ballista when you're playing this deck. Mhm. Yeah, and I think it's really important, as we've said, the activated ability helps clear the way for you to resolve a walking ballista and protect it from removal. It's kind of like having a Teferi Time Raveler out without ever having to play blue. Yeah, and it all fits under Collected Company, too, so you can just kind of get it, have it come into play, draw your other card, sacrifice it, silence your opponent, win. GG. GG's. Wait for the person who lost to extend their hand for a handshake. I'm not good at that. I'm always, I'm, I, I'm always the, I, like, I'm always the person who extends my hand either way. Like in all life situations, I'm always the first one to be like, Hey, let's shake hands in this economy. I gave a lot of dabs at Phoenix because <laughs> ha- people's people's hands, there's lots of colds out there. Mm-hmm. It's, it's okay to dab. So really great suite of tutors and tutorable cards within this, within this deck. And that's one of the main kind of strengths of green over the last few years, right? Is really effective, valuable, tutor-esque effects. I think one other difference to mention is that the Anafenza Kindry Spirit, the only tutors that version of the deck runs is Coco and Ranger Captain. Whereas the Vizier version has Finale Devastation. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, the the Anafenza one runs once upon a time as well. Fair. So it, the only thing it doesn't run is Finale of Dev- Devastation, which totally makes sense, right? You're not making infinite mana with that one, so you don't get the occasional bonus where you're attacking with uh, 50-50 Birds of Paradise and Noble Hierarchs or whatever. But um, yeah, still running the most broken card in this deck, which is Once Upon a Time, really, I think. But So the next category that we should talk about is the kind of ways that this deck can go faster than other decks that it's playing against. And one of the main tools available to a green combo deck when it wants to go faster is ramp, right? Green is the color of mana dorks. And so both of these decks run different suites of mana dorks, depending on what makes sense for their deck. So each of these decks runs main board runs a couple of birds of paradise, at least Mm -hmm. and four noble hierarch. Decks that have Vizier of Remedies in them also run a four-pack of Devoted Druid, which is one of your combo pieces, but is also a really powerful ramp spell, as, as kind of Stan mentioned earlier. And I'll tell you, one of the big plays that I did multiple times with this deck when I was playing it with, with it was to uh, tap and untap my Devoted Druid a couple of times so that I could ramp into a um, 
a turn three collected company when I only had um, when I only had two lands or something like that. That's great. To just kind of like really go all in against a deck that I didn't think was going to punish me for that kind of move. Don't do it against a lava dart. But <laughs> so ramp is really huge in this deck, and you know it's one of the main powerful things that green has, and this deck definitely takes advantage of that. Yeah, there's also a handful of utility cards. Uh, the Anafensa version runs Giver of Ruins for protection. Uh, the all-in combo version runs Eternal Witness just for some extra redundancy, get back a walking ballista or a combo piece that may have been removed. Yeah, one of the best feelings is collected companying into an Eternal Witness because you, you just get your Coco back out of the graveyard. It feels really good. That's, that is an amazing move. I actually had that where I was trying to infinite mana into a payoff card, like trying to find walking ballista or ranger captain of, of EOS. And I went collect a company. I already had, um, eternal witness in my hand, brought back collect a company. Like you said, hit the ranger captain on the second one and then got my ballista and then managed to go off and kill somebody. And that was all one turn. Of course. Sounds good. So we talked about ramp. Let's just take a quick second to talk about the mana in this deck. Because at first it seems like there really aren't a ton of bells and whistles to the mana base here. Lots of feshes to hit your various colors. Typically weighted toward white and green. But there are a couple of black sourcing uh, shock lands. So that if you want to fetch up one of your main deck sack outlets or maybe some sideboard cards, you can do that. It also has Horizon Canopy, which I found like it was probably a bit better in the Oops All Combos version because sometimes in the Anafenza version, I didn't want to go down on lands. Um, I don't know if you guys had that same experience, but Horizon Canopy, I found a harder card to play with than it looks at first. It's just like flood protection. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just like you don't you don't necessarily really care about your life total because your goal is to gain infinite life. Uh, so it just helps you mitigate flood. But I agree that I very infrequently sacked horizon canopy where it happens all the time in other decks because it did feel like for some reason I was a little low on lands all the time. Yeah. Because of all the ramp creatures and even the once upon a times, a lot of these decks are only running about 20 lands. So sometimes it can be hard to get to three or four lands even. Yeah. With the mana base, what's crazy is how, often against any deck that's like killing my mana dorks i had a little bit of mana trouble like hitting double colored sources because sometimes you have to hit double white like if you want to cast a ranger captain sometimes you have to get double green to get that spike feeder and i did run into some trouble when i wasn't able to sort of fetch up the exact shocks i needed uh, or i you know i had a uh, one of my few basics in my opener and just had to keep it so it, it is slightly irksome to have your mana dorks killed and and a lot of this deck is relying on your mana dorks not being killed because people aren't really running that much interaction yeah it's like if you face a deck with lightning bolts you better be careful yeah i had some rough times against for playing against burned and, and mono red prowess with a deck that's full of infinite life kind of combos it, it was tough for me to keep up sometimes you'd essentially have to double spell right just try to get heliod and spike feeder on the battlefield in the same turn and try to do the infinite life combo in response to your opponent's attempts at interaction. Yeah. And even then, if they're smart, they're holding their bolt for when you get spike feeder out. Right. And then, or they hold it for when you try to trigger your spike feeder and then you have to do it again. And then you yeah. just gained four life, which is okay, but really <laughs> bad in this, in, in this shell. Yeah. I had one game against mono red prowess where I think I had, I was way ahead in early position. I was trying to combo off on turn three and I was trying to run them out of mana. And I played like I played a turn two druid. I think I had three druids in hand and I was like, they can't possibly have stuff to kill all my druids. I just kept playing druid over and over again. They killed it like every time it was, it was pretty brutal. Ugh. Gulp. Yeah. So I think this is a good segue to just talk about some of the general strategies we discovered while playing our various Heliod company builds. Yeah, I think the first one goes without saying, but we're going to harp on it a bit. If you're going to do well or you want to do well with these strategies, you pretty much have to understand all of your combo outs mm -hmm. and how to either tutor for a combo or how to maneuver a tricky board state to find a combo when you're pressed up against the wall and you need to make something happen to not lose. 
Yeah, I think there's probably like a little bit of a different game plan versus like non-interactive and interactive decks because non-interactive, you know, that's going to be a race, right? So your goal is to combo off as soon as feasible so you can race them. Like Titan's not really going to disrupt your game plan very much, at least game one. So you know you can just tap out, stick like a devoted druid on turn two, hope you untap with it on turn three, or assume you'll untap with it on turn three. But um, with decks with interaction, you have to try to slip things through the opponent's shields. You kind of try to fake them out by playing maybe a, a piece of a combo that you don't actually have the other half to to try to bait out a fatal push early on. Uh, you maybe have to hold things up so you can double spell or end of turn collect a company and get lucky. So you hit like maybe a piece or two that you might need. Interaction is honestly what I don't want to see when I'm playing this deck because it's really challenging to get through those shields oftentimes. Like Stan said earlier, it just doesn't feel like you're doing much if you're not comboing off, especially the the Vizier Druid combo. Like you and you just don't have Heliod online as a creature very much, and so like your board kind of looks like a bunch of mana dorks and a not very cool enchantment on the battlefield, and you're like, well, what am I doing here? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the best plant situations that I got into there a couple of times were when I suddenly switched to being like, I guess I'm gonna get Heliod out, and then I'm just gonna kill you with Ranger Captain of Eos. Right. Like I'm gonna give it lifelink and make it a four, four and it's going to have exalted. So it's really a five, five. And I had a couple of games that went that way. And then I had a couple of games where I brought in Mirren crusader from the sideboard against removal decks and, and just kind of like got in there because I gained a, you, you put two counters on it a turn because it has double strike. And so there's an interesting kind of synergy there. Yeah. Shane is blinking his eyes right now. Yeah, I forgot about that. You never you never got to do that particular move? Oh, no. No, the particular move that always happens is it gets thoughts he's out of my hand. <laughs> oh, the Mirror Crusader? Bye. Yeah. Uh, but I definitely, I played against Jund and, and beat them beca- off of the back of a couple of Mirror Crusaders in one game. And that that was good. Um, got, got, the cru- got the Crusader out of bolt range and then kind of went on my way. Um, but yeah, I think that definitely the Druid combo version is 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 tougher to turn into a beatdown deck. And this is, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why I actually really enjoyed playing the end offensive version because it just gave me something to do with my mana and something to do with my turns rather than sitting on my hands. Mm -hmm. I think this is a deck that really benefited from the London Mulligan. And to get to those combo pieces, especially in the devoted version, you get to Mulligan aggressively because you want some combination of either ramp spells to get to your payoffs quicker or just have the combos in your hand so that as soon as you have the, enough mana, uh, you can combo off. Yeah, I also think that this is a deck that really, really benefited from what I'm going to call the OAT mulligan, which is how many once upon a times can I get in my in my hand to be able to um, to fix my hand off of that and see what's going on. I mean, this is again just something to think about. I mean, I there's nothing I love more than like sitting there for a couple turns, playing a couple of lands, and seeing holding back on casting a spell until I really have to, so I know what card I'm looking for off of Once Upon a Time. Um, really powerful, and especially with the London Mulligan, it, it makes a deck like this really hum. Oh yeah, it. It reminds me of like even playing sort of the the devotion decks in Pioneer, where you you really want a mana dork, or you can keep you can keep a a, a hand with no mana dork. You can keep like a one lander with a mana dork because you, you can just assume you're going to get that second land off the once upon a time. It's just such protection and such consistency against mulliganing and keeping questionable hands at the same time. I, I think another strategy that's really important, even though it doesn't always feel like it, I think is collected company and prioritizing casting it. It's just such a high value spell in the deck. Yeah. I mean, you were talking to CCR from Grindcast, right, Shane? And he was like, this is the main thing to do with the deck is try to cast collected company as fast as possible. A lot of times. Yeah. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of like was one of the tips he gave is just prioritize casting this. Like it's just when I was playing really good, I definitely felt like that was happening. Yeah. You know, like I wanted to ramp into it. I wanted to put my devoted druid into harm's way to try to cast it to make sure that I got it out on turn three. Like every time you can cast collect a company on turn three, it just felt like good things happened afterwards. Yeah, it can be rough at the same time. I agree with you there, Shane. I think the number of tutors in the vizier version, as well as just like mana dorks throughout, kind of gives you a higher than 
comfortable rate of whiffing. And even though the math is probably pretty good, you know, I used to play Coco and Elves, where every time you cast Coco, you just kind of hit a home run no matter what you find. And here, I would like either find just a walking ballista and a bunch of lands or like a couple birds and a Viserysir. And it's like, I don't really have a ton to do with these right now. And these aren't always the pieces that I want. So I think you have to have some tolerance for, for whiffing. Can I give you some math real quick? Math me, Dave. I just think it's good for everybody to, to hear it. So here's the way that I think you can break this down when you're thinking about it a little bit, because Stan kind of laid out a bunch of qualifiers on what was a good hit and what was not a good hit, right? So if you look at this with like the first level math, the first level math is this is a deck with either 30 or 31 creatures in it. How likely are you to hit two creatures off of casting a collected company? And so the way I run the, I ran the math off of that is basically, I just said, what if the population size is the deck is 59 cards. It's all the cards that are left in the deck other than a single collected company because there's no way for us to predict what's in your hand, what's in the battlefield and all that kind of stuff. If you cast a collected company with 30 creatures in your deck, you are 91% to hit two creatures off of collected company. Okay? Okay. 91% to hit two. Now, Stan, after he mentioned that, was like, I don't want to hit mana dorks. I don't want to hit Walking Ballista, and I don't want to hit Viscerous here. Okay, so that in the, the build of the Heliod Company deck that we were playing removes eight creatures from the sample size that we're looking for the, from the successes because there's four Noble Hierarchs, two Birds of Paradise, a Viscerous here, and a Walking Ballista. Mm-hmm. These are mostly cards you don't want. I think there's some places where you'd be okay with pulling Viscerous here depending on what you're looking at, but like you probably don't want it. Sure. If you look at the math from that, the math is still plenty good, but it's nowhere near as kind of like gaudy as 91%. It is 73.5%. So that's assuming that you still want to like action creatures off of the top of your deck. And that still includes devoted druid, which can kind of be like, eh, maybe it's good. Maybe it's not good in a given situation. Mm -hmm. So you're still more likely to get two creatures than not in two action creatures, even, even in the situation than not, which is like why collected company is such a good card. But th- you got to think about how to qualify when you're running math like this beyond just saying, well, there's 30 creatures in the deck. I want two creatures. What happens when I get that? One thing you guys mentioned is how good Coco is on turn three. How often are you casting it during your main phase? It depends. Like sometimes if I'm like, if I hit one card I want, I'm going to win type thing and the opponent's tapped out i'd main phase it yeah and then i and then i'd whiff sure i mean i main phased it looking for ranger captain of eos quite often or eternal witness depending on what was in my graveyard you know because i would have the infinite mana combo up i would be looking to get eternal witness or ranger captain so i could get my um get my walking ballista and kind of go from there so i i, th- I feel like i main phased it quite frequently really all right let's move on One of the other most important cards, Ranger Captain of Eos. Not only because it's a tutor, as we mentioned, it's a really reliable protection spell. If you sack a captain during your upkeep, you can then play out your combo pieces without having to worry about interaction or removal. I want to emphasize one other thing here, which is playing it on your opponent's upkeep. Yes. If you are facing another sort of non-interactive deck. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, let's say you're facing a Titan deck that you think is going to cast some ramp spells like Explorer or something like that. Or you think you're facing Wurza, which wants to be able to play out some certain non- uh, non-creature spells like War of Invention. Yeah, War of Invention or even, you know, Astrolabe and Mitra's Bauble. Like they just can't do any of that stuff if you hit them during their upkeep. So you want to make sure you keep an eye out for decks that are trying to do sorcery speed things so that you just buy yourself one more turn. Yeah. I mean, some of my favorite plays with the deck where it was against like ad nauseum Mm -hmm. where they had, you know, like, like dual Lotus bloom on suspend. And when they're coming off suspend, I just sacrifice my Ranger captain. So just blanks both their their Lotus Blooms that are going to come off suspend. They can't cast them. Um, you can, like you said, you can buy yourself a turn. Like if they have access to five mana and they're going to cast as ad nauseum, you can blank them there. There's a lot of you know fun things you can do. Like a lot of suspend spells, it definitely can really tilt the opponent by by just making them unable to cast them. 
like you knew about it, but they, but you know, they didn't necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely the smaller use case for this card, but you, you have to use it offensively sometimes as well, essentially. For sure. One thing that you have to really think about when you're playing this deck is that you have to consider what happens if your opponent does have removal because most decks do have removal right and so you have to find a way to bait out your opponent's removal so that you get to play the cards that matter to you Mm -hmm. and since so many different creatures in this deck are kind of high value right there they are combo pieces they are pieces that get you combo pieces you have to play this sort of leveling game with your opponent where you play out the card that you don't care about so that they use a removal spell on it. So you can play out your other card that you actually do care about. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, it was like one of the things I like doing was sort of play out like a devoted Druid and just be like, I don't have the other part of this. And I know the opponent's going to be so afraid of me having it that they're going to push it or something like that, which clears the way for maybe eventually sticking the spike feeder I need to, or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's super important is just to f- constantly be feeling out, well, I'm short of infinite life, but I've got infinite mana, so I'm going to play Spike Feeder Uncovered and see if they kill it. Walking Ballista, an interesting s- creature in this deck, right? Like, it only runs a singleton of this card because it's just not super high value to draw it or to Coco into it, as we mentioned earlier, right? But yet, it's such an integral piece of, you know, killing your opponent. And so I had a lot of problems or just a lot of trouble, like knowing exactly how to play my ballista. Like when do I expose it to removal? If ever, like it's the kind of thing where I need to untap with it so that I can do something with Helia the next turn. I'm never going to be able to cast this and win with it probably. Or maybe I should have just sandbagged longer and been like, I'm going to cast this for, you know, with six mana up or something like that. Like, how are you guys playing and, and, and using Walking Ballista? I felt like I only wanted it as a combo piece, and I basically never wanted to draw it. Yeah. I only wanted to grab it off of... Um, Finale. I only wanted to grab it off of Ranger Captain. Or, yeah, or Ranger Captain, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really awkward piece to figure out what to do with because, you know, in so many other decks, not only is it more than a one of, but it can be such an important interaction spell. And I really had to train myself to think about this as a non-interactive deck. And you don't really want Ballista to clear the board. You almost want it to have one mode, which is be, you know, so big your opponent loses as soon as you cast it. Or rather, you know, cast it with uh, enough mana up to give it lifelink and do the combo. So it was kind of tricky. I had to retrain my brain. I don't know if it's necessarily correct that this deck should only have one, though. And maybe that's me kind of being like worst case scenario thinking, but uh, it it really stunk whenever, you know, I had it countered or I kind of misplayed and and it got into the graveyard. And then it's like, well, what do I do now? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got to really be careful with this deck against counter spells. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're not main decking Veil of Summer yet. Yeah, but it's super good out of the sideboard in this deck, huh? Sure is. Oh, yeah, it's great. Let's talk about that sideboard a little bit, right? Like, it's this is where the deck gets to pivot. Right. Yeah, it's just all the Veil of Summers. I just want all of them. <laughs> you pretty much do. Yeah, you get Veil of Summers. You get essentially all of your interaction spells. This is where Path to Exile hangs out. Uh, you get some Damping Spheres. Our aforementioned Mirren Crusaders. Um, even the decks I played always had a one of Avon Mind Sensor. Oh, yeah. Which makes me wonder, would this card see play right now if not for Titan? It's pretty good against this deck, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Because the deck has access to black, you also get uh, to play Thoughtseize. So this was a bit more difficult for me. I I was often kind of struggling to figure out what decks to bring Thoughtseize in against. What do, what do you guys think about how to bring Thoughtseize in? Personally, I like it against other combo strategies. I think that's like a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would even bring it in against control, you know, removal or or mid-range for that matter, because removal and uh, board wipes or any other interaction can be so backbreaking that if you take a turn off to swipe that out of your opponent's hand, I think that could be enough to buy you enough time to then combo off even like by casting two creatures on the same turn. Yeah, I primarily looked at Thoughtseize 
like you mentioned earlier, which is against combo decks, like cards that you absolutely have to remove from your opponent's hand or they can outrace you, like an ad nauseum style deck, for instance, or you know, perhaps like even like Amulet Titan, like you have to get that prime time out of their hand before they cast it. Question about some sideboard decisions that you guys made. Do you ever take out any combo pieces? Yes. Oh, yeah. I often found myself sideboarding out all of the kitchen finks and the viscerous here mm-hmm. to bring in interaction. So I would basically be like, I'm more interested in the infinite mana. And I only played the the infinite mana deck, the druid version, where we'd be like, I'm more interested in the infinite mana combo. I'm going to bring in all my interaction and take out this alternate uh, life combo and just do that. I also often took out a, a collected company or one once upon a time so that I could just find a little bit more space. You don't really want to draw multiples of those all the time. And so I was kind of okay doing that as well. I'm surprised to hear you took out Coco. Just one, but just kind of shave it a little bit for, for the interaction. Yeah. Against um, any deck with a lot of interaction, the infinite mana combo came out immediately because it's just too unreliable to keep in. And so I'd rather have the interaction spells for like their Tarmogoy, for their Death Shadows, or their Urza, things like that. That's what typically I, I would do that swap a lot. That's interesting. I never I never took out the infinite mana combo. Oh yeah. I felt I felt like it was just way it's way too fragile against interaction in my opinion. I I did that a lot. You would do that a lot in the old green white combo decks. You would kind of just side out the combo. So you go all in on on the infinite life. life combo, basically? Yeah, I guess interactive decks, yeah. Interesting. This might be a good opportunity to just mention as an aside that Shane has been playing these green-white toolbox decks for a very long time. I'm not good with them. But he but has had them. them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about most of my decks, though, to be honest. I'm not good with it, but I do have it. <laughs> Shall we move on to playing against Heliod combo? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how you might play against Heliod Company combo. And it's not really that complicated, in my opinion, because I think it's it's probably usually just safe to say you're going to remove pieces of the combo when they become issues, right? Like, And I would suggest not preemptively removing pieces that don't have the other half being cast. And so there's not really a ton of reasons to say, take out a Vizier of Remedies or a Spike Feeder or even a devoted druid when they're the only creature on the board. Like you can respond to the other parts of the combos being cast at a a later point. So there's so many little pieces that can fit together that you might want to save your removal for when things are actually starting to come together for your opponent. So that instance I gave earlier where it's like, Hey, I'm going to cast this devoted druid and just kind of freak my opponent out. Like there's no reason for you to to just instantly kill it. Like unless the tempo loss is so bad for you not to, to not just wait for me to try to cast the vizier of remedies and say, Oh, well now I can kill this devoted druid. That said, I think if the Heliod player casts a turn one bird of paradise or noble hierarch, you essentially have to remove that on site. Bird, the yeah. bolt the bird still applies here because they can ramp into pretty powerful spells on turns two and three. Yeah. I don't think you would still want to see like a turn two Heliod. Yeah, honestly, removal is really the name of the game like, against decks like this, in my opinion, as well. Yeah, use your removal. Hope their collected companies miss. Spell Pierce, their collected companies, if you got it, probably, right? I mean, you don't have a ton of access to... I mean, that's, you know, it's a narrow card against them, but it's pretty good. I don't think this deck has the ad nauseum problem where it will sometimes very literally ad nauseum will sometimes just lose to itself. Whereas this one can just dirtle where it doesn't do anything and, and, and loses to itself sort of just through inactivity. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the things that you can do against this deck are just to hold up your removal, hold up your counter spells. When they try to resolve anything important, take it out. Like if, if I'm just sitting there casting a noble hierarch, a bird of paradise, trying to bait out something from you saying like, no, oh, I might use a counter spell here. It's like, well, just don't mm-hmm. like, you know, use, use it for the important stuff that matters and, and just grind the opponent out, make them have a board of a bunch of cruddy mana dorks that they're not doing anything with. And it, you're going to just frustrate them because they don't have a lot of ways of increasing their card draw beyond a collected company which you could probably sandbag your own removal to take out the important pieces or horizon canopy cycling, which is pretty slow. Yeah. 
I thought mid range was one of the absolute toughest matchups that I got paired against like several times throughout all of my testing. So if you want to beat Devoted Druid, play mid range. That mix of hand disruption for combo pieces and removal for anything gets on the board, pretty hard to get through, especially for the oops all combo version, I think. I mean, Shadow raced me n- n- numerous times. You know, they they have the ability to take out anything important from my hand, remove anything important on the battlefield, and just have gigantic Death Shadows and, and Goifs. Yeah, I even lost to Blue Moon once because they bolted all of my mana dorks. I didn't, I didn't fetch enough basics that they cast a Blood Moon, and then there was just nothing I could do. Yeah, Blood Moon really stinks if you don't have mana dorks. <laughs> I mean, this deck does have a lot of a lot of basics, at least. So at least you have an out to be able to get them. What did you guys like about playing this deck? Turn three wins. <laughs> and that never stinks. Virtual wins? No, full on. I mean, in the, in the infinite mana ones, you can just win on turn three. Sure. Yeah, if you have a great hand, if you have a tutor in your hand. Yeah, I mean, and, and really, you can just, if you get a mana dork in play, you can even be able to tutor... You know, if you have four mana out with turn three, you can drop Vizier of Remedies, drop a, uh, you know, go start going infinite, drop a Ranger Captain of Eos, tutor up your walking ballista and just go to town. I definitely had a number of games like that were similar to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of fun to try to put these pieces together and kind of like know how they work and, and, and work with them. I think it's probably a lot more fun in paper when you can mm-hmm. when you can dem- you can just be like, here's this loop. Here's how it works. And 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 go through those actions rather than all of the triggers on magic online. But I think that if you like, if you like creature combo decks, this is the, the creature combo deck du jour. And it gives you so many different little things to work with that. It's kind of fun that in that fashion, I have a little theory. I want to run past you guys. Mm -hmm. I I wonder if the Anna Fenza version is the level one configuration of the deck. And then the oops, all combos is kind of like level three or four. Because in my experience, I started with the Vizier version, and I struggled with it a lot because I don't have a ton of experience with these creature toolbox decks. But Anna Venza made it a lot easier to just navigate a more diverse series of like board states and games because if nothing else, I knew I could turn creatures sideways. Whereas once you have an eye for the different outs that this type of deck has then you can actually execute combos more reliably that may not be intuitive to people who are new to ty- these types of strategies. I mean, I personally don't think the the combos are particularly complex. And I think that, I think it's really kind of what you're expecting to see, right? Like I think Stan, the Anafenza deck that you enjoy a little bit more is probably better if you're, if you're expecting to see a lot of Jund or, or Death Shadow or things like that. Um, and the you just want to go a little bit faster, maybe a half turn faster with the infinite mana combo that, that Dave was experiencing. So I really think it's like a metagame call or like or a metagame response. Like whatever you're seeing on the field might be what you're responding to in, in your build. A little bit harder to play. I think because you are going more towards infinite life more often, right? In that deck, in the Anna Fence version, or is it more towards infinite damage? It's more towards infinite, more towards infinite life, more towards infinite life, which is a little bit more difficult because you still sometimes have to kill people. Yes, mm-hmm. with that sense in a way that's expeditious, whether you're on moto or in paper. Um, I think that the infinite mana combo just gives you an out where you can sort of just end the game quickly. Shall we talk about some of the troubles we had playing this deck? For sure. How about you, Stan? Where were you troubled? (laughs) Oh, man. Well, the elephant in the room is just that this deck is hard to play on Magic Online. Brutal. It stinks. There's so many triggers. There's so much clicking. And it's really easy to mess up. Yeah, for sure. I definitely lost a match to taking two counters off of my spike feeder who did that raise your hand if you did that yep yep me too oh my hand is raised that was one of like the first things i did like because i just didn't wait for the the heliod the heliod thing was still on the stack and i i clicked and it was just like oh duh um like once i realized i could save a target that helped a little bit you still have to wait for the the trigger to resolve at least you don't have to click and retarget it every time to like put the counter only on spike feeder yeah so it still takes a really long time. 
Yeah, and then the kitchen finks plus a sack outlet. Oh God! Plus Heliod one is awful because you can't save them. Nope. Yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible. But yeah, you can't save it because the finks is leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back, and so it's like it's honestly just not viable. Yeah. So if you don't play Magic Online, it does have the software has some like shortcuts that you can. Uh, uh, occasionally do that will save certain triggers so they yield automatically and you know you can even sometimes save targets for certain triggers so the spike feeder heliod combo is a little easier to do than the visir Sierra combo because with spike feeder and heliod you can save the heliod triggers target ability to always put counters on your spike feeder and that way it takes like 60 seconds but you're gaining like 200 life yeah, you still have to click in the right order, though. Yeah, yeah. that's the problem. Is like if you if you mess up that sequence, then you just killed your spike feeder, and it's like whoops. And what stinks is in paper, and we'll talk about this in the wind down. But people don't like to scoop on Magic Online. No, I feel like when I when I played Druid, they would actually scoop more often, like to the infinite life. Like if I demonstrated kind of the kitchen finks combo, I used to get more scoops, and I, I think that the the thought process has been changing recently about what people consider to be kind of like, uh, like bad manners or good manners on magic online related to gaining, you know, arbitrarily large amounts of life. I guess we call that a tease. Yeah. A bit of a tease. (laughs) Um, I did find that there are certain other situations where sequencing was kind of tricky. Uh, for instance, one of my, stupidest misplays was giving something protection from white with giver ruins and then trying to target it with heliod and give it a uh, lifelink that's a no-no oh yeah that's bad don't do that don't do that yeah in mean, sequencing is just tough in general because a lot of it is what do i need next turn like what do i need this turn am i trying to you know if I, am i trying to bait something out like we've talked about you know can i do I play the devoted druid now? Do I wait till I have more mana so I can double spell? Do I want this walking ballista now? Do I want it, you know, on turn four? It, there's can I can I play a walking ballista? Give something lifelink. Get a second counter on walking ballista. It's just like there's lots of different ways you can use your mana in this deck that can generate more advantageous board states for you and figuring them out can be tricky and with experience they get a little bit easier but there's still a lot of novel board states you can find yourself in that you're like i've never been in this exact situation before Mm -hmm. and unlike other combo decks you know ad nauseum storm you know through the breach which are stack based combos this is a board based combo that relies entirely on creatures or you know fundamentally on creatures so you know the sheer number of creature removal that is available in modern i think makes this a little bit more vulnerable to mid-range and interactive decks so be it fatal push path to exile lightning bolt abrupt decay assassin's trophy ravenous chupacabra (laughs) you have a lot of options to kill creatures and sometimes that sets you back a couple turns and potentially just loses you the game outright and like you said before stan i think this deck feels pretty weak when it's not working and so you're like, you know, my board is, is just some dorks and it's, it's this weird enchantment. It's not doing anything for me. And that can be just frustrating. You're like, this is just not working at all. And that doesn't feel good. Yeah, it's like the the Vizier version doesn't really have great fail states. What was my take? No, I don't think so either. You can beat down maybe with a Ranger Captain. You can beat down maybe with a Kitchen Finks. At least with Anafenza, you can turn Anafenza sideways and it'll sometimes do some damage dave what do you think overall i really liked playing this deck huh. Good, actually i i would definitely sleeve this up again i think if i it's definitely a deck that's kind of on my radar to try to finish i have i have all these cards except for heliod so i would consider it um this is the first time i tried to play the vizier druid combo and i definitely think that i would continue to play those cards because that is very sweet to go off on turn three basically um, and so I, I think it's powerful enough that I would give it a try. I am more inclined to try to play it in paper than I am online. So I don't think I'm going to be like a, like a moto grinder with it, but exactly. uh, yeah. I thought the deck was sweet. I, I really, 
I like all the tutors. I like the plans that it has. And even in the moments where you totally whiff, it still feels like it's powerful enough that it makes up for it later. Yeah, I want to play it in paper for sure. I, I regret my choices a little bit because I started with the Vizier version. I was pretty unhappy with it because I found the fail states or lack thereof so frustrating that I then tried the Anafenza version. But I think if I had done it the other way around where I played Anafenza and then started to understand what the deck is capable of and thus made it more complex by adding this infinite mana combo and more tutors, I may have been a little bit more successful with the infinite mana version. I don't see myself playing this deck ever again. <laughs> but that's because I just like holding mana up. I like interacting. But it is super valuable to know what this deck is vulnerable to and what it's capable of because I think this is one of those format mainstays you know even if you know once upon a time gets banned for instance this deck is going to stick around because Eladamri's call is still legal Coco is always going to be legal Finale of Devastation is always going to be legal so I think it's important to understand what this deck is capable of and there's a lot of value just in that even if you're like me and you don't want to play green if you don't want to cast Birds of Paradise oh I don't want to cast Anafenza Kintry Spirit. I do constantly look at Noble Hierarch these days and in modern and just go, ah, it's a rough times for you, huh, huh, old friend. <laughs> like a lot of good decks are running it still, but I'm also kind of like, oh, just playing like Lanawar. What's this? Mostly Lanawar Elves. I mean, I know it's a lot more powerful than Lanawar Elves. Um, is is kind of like, oof, okay, maybe I'm not at the power level I should be, but then I'll, all of a sudden I'm like, casting a 40-40 walking ballista on turn three, and I'm like, bye. So, makes up for it, I guess. <laughs> Bye-bye. Well, I think that wraps up the, this week's Dive Down on Heliod Combo. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to finish some combos. We have some clicking to do. And when we return, we're going to have a quick chat about Magic Online etiquette. Stay with us. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into this really quick. We don't have a lot of runtime left for this episode, but as we mentioned, one of the issues we ran into playing this deck on Magic Online is that people do not concede when you have infinite life demonstrated. Yeah, and because it's just it's just it's so hard to do it, and so like you know, uh, it just takes so long. And and a lot of decks can like just make that damage to get you dead. Like a, a Primeval Titan deck could easily kill you from a couple hundred life by just making a million zombies over the next few turns. Yeah. I died against an Urza's deck, Urza deck where they had f three constructs out that were like 13, 13 constructs. And they just killed me from 200 life over a couple of turns. <laughs> I mean, so, so the issue is like, even if you have a larger, if you have like a larger deck than your opponent, and you could feasibly gain like a million life and just do nothing else for the rest of the game. Just draw a card, say go, right? The opponent would deck themselves. The process for gaining enough life to just seriously put yourself out of all damage range on Magic Online is so time consuming that you really can't actually do that very often. And so like in paper, you can demonstrate a loop. You can just say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This results in this. And like, you're actually obligated to shortcut it. It's against the rules for your opponent to make you like do the various motions that you would have to do. It's just like a delay of game essentially, mm -hmm. but in magic online that simply doesn't exist. And, uh, you, so you can't shortcut like the spike feeder Heliod combo or even like the Druid vizier mana combo. And so, we both, we all ran into this and we kind of had a little discussion in channel and it got to the question, like, is this bad manners you know, or is it even like, you know, is it unethical? That's kind of a big term to use here to not scoop on magic online when you would do so in paper. Like, I don't think you just have to scoop to infinite life, but I, I feel like if you would scoop in paper, you should scoop on magic online. So I don't want to pretend like I actually believe this take, but the devil's advocate response I often see on Twitter or hear in conversation is, if you know that MTGO has this limitation, yes, you still made the choice to play the deck. Yes. So if, if you really struggle with people's willingness or not to scoop, 
don't you have you know the option to play a different deck thanks to manatraders.com you do but not when you're testing it for an episode of the dive down podcast right yeah i really like the point you made about if you're going to do something in paper why not do it online and you know in some cases you could just make the argument that the stakes are different online you know online online you're playing for tickets they're almost as good as currency you can literally cash them out not always the case that you're lgs yeah, a lot of the arguments that I see are kind of like, yeah, you know what you're getting into. The 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 rules engine is just different in Magic Online. Some people were saying like I would scoop in a league, but I wouldn't scoop in anything like a PTQ or a premier level event and I'm like that's an interesting sort of argument to get into. Like what's the actual difference here besides the the stakes involved? And to me it just sort of gets it like the it's a game. We're playing a game. Um, it's a game based on paper cards. The Magic Online rules engine and software itself has limitations. Don't use those limitations to your advantage. Did you guys ever feel like you were racing the clock, though, with this deck? I had a couple of moments where I was. Yeah, I lost uh, against a control deck early on in the in a league because I was racing against the clock, ultimately. I was racing my patience. Right. Follow-up question. Did you ever try to adopt any kind of like tricks or, 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 or chat language that would potentially try to encourage your opponent to scoop in a polite way? Because for instance, here's what I would do. If I had spike feeder combo online, I would write in chat, I, I make infinite life here. If you'd like, we can go to the next game. And then I would just start making as much life as I can for like a couple minutes to see if that motivated them to scoop. <laughs> Which I, I don't think that's rude. I'm just... No, it's not rude. This is what I'm capable of doing. Like, hey, do you do you know this combo? Yeah, <laughs> Dave, what do you think? You you have more you have more game experience. You remember Magic Online experience than any of us, I think. The first thing I want to say is, Stan, don't ever open the chat. <laughs> yeah, I never close it, dog. Don't open it uh, unless it's someone you know. Which then I say something. I just want people to say, "Hey, Stan, you're from the dive down." Yeah, never had that happen to me. I guess it's never going to happen to me. Screen name Halo Bender. Find me. Don't at me. Um, I guess, I mean, look, honestly, I, I don't scoop in this situation, so it's really hard for me to ask that of other people. Oh, no. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? I don't know, man, because I want to try to get enough points so I can play another league for free. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not I'm not trying to be, like, too, like, stringent about this, but um, I don't. And so I just want to be honest. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I probably don't either. It's it's so much easier to hit F6. No, you're terrible people. And just like wait for them to do their thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't do it against like Thopter Foundry or any of that other kind of stuff. I'm just like, whatever, go ahead. Take all the time you need to combo off and then and then I'll die maybe after you spend five minutes a clock. Those actually kill you. Like those actually kill That's you. That's true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like the, the infinite life is just like, hey, I know this is really annoying for you to do. I have no other way to win because I know that you can just not do anything and we'll, and I'll deck myself, but I'm going to make you do it anyway. And I find that just to be like the frustrating angle because the deck is so built around infinite life now, as opposed to infinite damage. So that can be frustrating for me. I mean, this is why I would definitely play the Druid version over the non Druid version on moto. If I was going to do it again, like I want to be able to have access to sure. I'll gain 400 life and then just be out there long enough for me to be able to cast my giant walking ballista. And then, and then we'll go to the next game. Yeah. I mean, I just wish that magic online had every capability of paper, but I know it just doesn't. So what are you going to do? I mean, my question is, do you think that the, this mechanic is artificially depressing the number of people who play Heliod. So let me let me give you some stats, a little refresher from last week, the modern assessment that we made of the prelims and stuff. Uh, Titan was still the top of our list in those ones, and uh, you know in the energy series it was second mm-hmm. this week. On Magic Online, it was not even in the top ten in the modern challenges or prelims as far as the uh, frequency of the deck appearing. Do you think that's because of the clickitude? I think you can make a pretty good case for yes. Yeah. I mean, after after running it through a couple leagues and the amount of people that didn't want to scoop to my to my loops, scoop to my loops. Um, yeah, I think that this definitely depressing the results of this deck. Yeah, that's very pinworthy, by the way. Scoop to my loop, my darling. 
Listen, at the end of the day, we can't make you, our listeners, scoop to anything. But perhaps if you find yourself in a situation where your opponent has an infinite combo going off before your eyes, think about us, your beloved Dive Down co-hosts, and, and think about how we felt when we lost games that we would have won in paper simply because we got tired of clicking this very annoying combo interaction on MTGO. And maybe you can make a fellow player feel better about their deck choices and have maybe a more authentic Magic the Gathering experience. Except Stan is not going to scoop to you, so like, don't get any ideas in your head. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I've never played this deck. so yeah, I mean, it's his birthday, so he doesn't have to scoop to anybody. I think that wraps up this week's show. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast, pick our brain on something in Modern, Pioneer, or Magic the Gathering in general, you can tweet us at the dive down, all one word, or email the dive down at gmail.com. We love seeing those occasional emails from our listeners, uh, people who we meet out in the wild, people who have questions about their decks or the decks we're playing. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. If you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon. We're joining at any tier gets you access to our super secret Slack channel. Check that out at patreon.com slash the dive down. Of course, as always, shout out to manatraders.com for sponsoring our show. You can sign up for Mana Traders using promo code the dive down, all one word, for 15% off your first three months of renting magic online cards. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and combo on!